Lots of political events, lots of uh, hobnobbing going on. Uh, it's been <laughs> something. Um, I, you know, I mean, that's part of why I'm looking at maybe for some of your observations. I mean, you're independent right now, but it gives you kind of a different lens to look at things. We've got two different races going on between conservative parties, in a sense. Uh, how do things look for Albertans as we watch this sort of stuff going on? Well, you know, there, there, there is some silver lining in what have been some gray clouds. And let's start with Ottawa, first of all. You know, the fact that $25 billion a year goes out of Alberta, the fact that in, in exchange for that, they deny us resource movement and deny us fairness. Um, but having said that, wh when I look at, uh, you know, all five of the Conservative Party of Canada leadership candidates and, and you know, and Pierre Polyev in the last little while and, and even John Charest with his Alberta Accord, uh, Rick Bell's article uh, yesterday Pierre has some strong pro-Alberta statements in there, which I thought he had been neglecting to say, but but talking about fairness and ending equalization and, and making things happen. So, yeah, so, I mean, Alberta is more on the radar in, in the Conservative Party of Canada than ever before. Um, will it make any difference? You know, all those I'll say to, to the Ottawa, Corey, is it had better. Uh, separation, independence, desire, desire for change has risen dramatically in Alberta. And uh, at some point in time, Ottawa is going to have to do something to give us equality and fairness, give us resource movement, or, or it's going to get much worse. Um, when I look at the Alberta race, um, I'm, I'm disappointed that it's underachieved so far. And, and Corey, though, I am so not surprised. Jason Kenney, when he didn't go away, when he didn't allow an intern leader to be appointed, uh, he still got his thumbs on the scales of this leadership race. And, and of course, there's, you know, there's some discussion about whether Danielle Smith is, is going to be allowed to, to fully enter it. The $175,000 was, you know, I got into politics with you in the Wild Rose in 2011 to keep big money out of politics. $175,000 that, you know, I believe you can self-fund it and then raise it later is putting big money into politics. It's not the, the and, and of course our candidates now, uh, the vast majority of them have been spending time focused on that rather than out uh, shaking hands, kissing babies and, and talking ideas with Albertans. Um, so again, I, I, I just see the UCP, you know, shoot themselves in the foot all the time. And, and so far this race is the same way. Yeah, I mean, it just smacks of a bit of elitism. I mean, I understand the purpose of a bar. Absolutely. I understand the purpose of an elections committee to say to some people, perhaps, you know, you're not appropriate to run. Uh, when, it, when I ran for an NDP nomination to sort of poke fun at them, I wasn't <laughs> yeah. shocked that they told me to get stuffed when I put in my paperwork, but they have the right to do that. But then when it gets arbitrary, when it gets, and, and when you're using a, a fiscal bar, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, if it was even, say, 50,000, you're going to be pretty serious before you lay out that kind of money to run for a leadership. But when you're getting all the way up to 175,000, that's their way of saying we don't want the commoners in this race. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and hey, let's talk Bill Rock, the one gentleman that had to, to you know, drop out. Uh, Amisk, Alberta is not anywhere near my constituency, but nobody has called me more over the last five years with ideas and concerns about rural crime more than Mayor Bill. And uh, his voice would have been good in there. He has some great ideas. He knows firsthand a lot of the real pressure points. And as you were talking about Tamara Leach, uh, who is from Medicine Hat, you know, you know, what is she now, 40 days in jail for mischief when the rest of our legal system is all about catch and release? Uh, I mean, it's, it's so sad to see the Internet and Twitter flooded with stories of people that have committed serious crimes and are right back out. And, 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 and Tamara's for mischief is in her 40th day. And, and who knows when that next bail trial, bail hearing will happen. Uh, but anyway, so so Bill Bill had a good voice. Bill's ideas would have would have made Alberta stronger. And uh, yeah, you know, you you have to have a bar somewhere, but 175,000 is ridiculous. And, and potentially we'll see more drop out. But again, I think what it's meant so far is the first three weeks has been all about raising money, you know, rather than discussing ideas. Um, so to me, the, the UCP leadership race has been a very underachieving so far. That is too bad. I, I had a couple of commenters, and I, I don't, uh, you know, expect you to dive in on, on individual candidates so much, but it's an interesting concept that got thrown out. And, and you started that, like alienation, the Western issues are finally in the focus, even on the federal front and definitely on the provincial front. 
And a couple of commenters are wondering, though, what you think of the proposed Alberta Sovereignty Act, or just, I guess, we could expand more than somebody else's specific policy, but uh, just the proposed policies on how to deal with Alberta standing up for itself against uh, Eastern incursions, you know, wh which route might work best within a provincial scope? Well, well, thank you, Corey. Yeah, I, I, I quite like the initiative itself. Here, here's, here's one of the, the leadership candidates with, with a good chance of, of success, bringing this idea forward, um, bringing this idea forward to, to cause a constitutional crisis, to open up the Constitution and, and force our Canadian partners to, to either give us fairness or, or maybe let us out, out someday. And really what it's all about is whatever Quebec has, Alberta should have as well. So, so that is hard to disagree with. Why, why shouldn't all 10 be, be treated equal? Um, but, you know, whether it comes to the Sovereignty Act or shutting off the taps, um, all these things are going to cause some unintended hardship and they're doing some things that are, that are out of our control. So when I came out with my dissenting opinion, when I was on the fair deal panel, and, and again, I'm so grateful that thousands of Albertans reached out to us and me with, with their ideas. I think I came up with some things that are all within Alberta's control. We need to have our own pension. It's $3 billion that would make it so seniors could afford their utilities here. We need to collect our own taxes. Um, you know, what we pay to Ottawa in interest and penalties alone would, would cover the cost of collecting the taxes and, and, and we'd have more, more say. We need control over immigration. We need our own policing. Uh, we, we, need, we need to put in the infrastructure closer to the grassroots, close, closer to local decision making and, and where, where Alberta has control. But Corey, the main thing I said then was three years from now, we should have an independence referendum. We should tell Ottawa today. Yes, we want to be part of Canada, but only if we get a fair deal and only if we get resource movement and free trade. You guys have three years to figure it out, three years to open up the Constitution, three years to put in the corridors and get the pipeline access and do what you need to do. And three years from now, we're going to have give Albertans the chance to hold you accountable. We're going to have an independence referendum and Albertans can decide if it's if it's time to to you know, turn up the heat if it's time to go or if we're happy enough with, with the deal that was proposed. Uh, like, unlike turning off the taps, which certainly has elements of unconstitutionality, uh, unlike, uh, you know, Danielle and, and the Freedom Alberta's group on the, on the Sovereignty Act, I mean, that has a lot of, a lot of issues that dance around, around legalities. Uh, to me, I thought this was cleaner and, and more direct. We, you know, we're going to give you three years to give us a fair deal. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm just hope that once we get past this this uh, leadership race that these things can be discussed fully and and i'm grateful in my 10 years that uh you know we can put alberta first yeah well there's no doubt that the status quo isn't cutting it and and maybe uh uh perhaps a referendum i you know i i think maybe we have to wait a little longer we'll see i mean that's certainly a tool as you're saying like we need to we need to poke the, the hornet's nest. This province isn't working. You know, this, this confederation isn't working out well. Like, like an interesting poll recently found that 21% of Ontarians responded saying that they felt their province would be better off outside of Canada. <laughs> well, yeah. if even Ontario has one in five people saying it, we should be reevaluating the entire package. And, and uh, it will take nothing less than a constitutional crisis, I think, for the, the powers that, to be to realize that they have to do this. Yeah, yeah, more of a European Union style where the provinces have have a lot more control and, and independence. And and yeah, we can still have our trade agreements if, if they'll cooperate. Um, you know, Corey, what hurts me is the hardship. You know, Alberta, Canada, we have the third biggest oil reserve in the world. I understand we're only the number five producer in the world. So in spite of all the things we've talked about ad nauseum, our great environmental record, our great social record, we're not meeting our potential. We have the third biggest and we're producing at number five. Um, I'm at a stampede breakfast a couple days ago and I'm talking to some oil and gas workers who take risk and work as hard as anybody who, who, who are having a little trouble still getting, you know, getting their equipment out, getting their jobs out, getting their skills out. And it's because we're not at full capacity. And, uh, and we all know the pipeline situation, uh, you know, Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion is virtually stalled. Energy East is non-existent. It goes on and on. And, and let's get our people back to work. And, and you know, and then we, when you look at the Canadian situation, how anti-competitive we are. Of course, we saw the Rogers, uh, you know, 
burnout the other day and all the problems that that caused. Uh, you look at all the money that the Canadian government is borrowing and what that has done to our, our interest rates now, plus the money they printed. Let's get a government that cares about, about balancing their, their budgets so banks will be more in tune with giving uh, small business uh, more competitive advantages. Um, you know, the, the just so many things in Canada that, uh, that could be better and, and don't match our values. Uh, again, Alberta values of hard work, risk taking and, and sharing the benefits um you know where we're living in this high tax world uh in and most of it to to ottawa where we don't get value it just seems like we're almost bent, bent on economic uh, self-destruction it, it, it's so frustrating and, and maddening to see um you, you're in a rural constituency it's a bit dry out in medicine hat but there's a lot of ranching and some agriculture and that uh, an issue that's been coming up we're seeing around the world of course in, in uh, the netherlands or sri lanka uh, the latest environmental push, I mean, they haven't stopped now with oil and gas. They're going after fertilizers, and that's really uh, causing, well, pressure on consumers and the agricultural community. Uh, are there any concerns about those? Because there's a proposed fertilizer reduction in Canada coming down the lines, too. Are, have you been hearing about that on uh, your ground level? Oh, yeah. People people here, here are very concerned. Uh, we're fortunate to have irrigation uh, west of town, and, uh, the, you know, those, those crops are... are those acreages are very productive. Yeah, there, there's huge concern. But but you know, but look what look what happens here, Corey. You know, the the environmentalists go after the oil and gas business. Jason Kenney's war room has been a disaster in, in trying to protect us for that. That should be eliminated. Uh, and then as soon as it, you know, now we're producing number five in the world, even though we're the third biggest. And what do they do? They they turn to to GMO nitrogen and now cattle. Uh, they're they're hard after after what we produce. Um, seems like uh, the environmentalists and those that uh, benefit from a, a different status quo or globalization and, and what the World Economic Forum offers, which is not not in sync with what uh, Medicine Hat and Cypress Medicine Hat needs. Um, yeah, we, we, we have to continue to push back. We have to get as effective as possible. And uh, and more than anything, we, we, we have to speak the truth. But, you know, Corey, we, we need some democratic reform. You know, Jason Kenney disappointed in so many ways, but maybe one of the biggest ways was in not putting in meaningful recall and meaningful citizen initiated uh, legislation laws. Yeah, he put things in that are, are maybe just being proclaimed now, but, but the signatures that are required to put things on the ballot, unlike Switzerland, where the Swiss people can actually overturn a federal law or, um, or put in a law with a, re with a referendum and a petition, uh, he didn't do that. He made the bar way, way too high. So, so we need to, to fix that democratic reform, Corey. We need to put in a system where if our politicians won't do it for us, the people need to be able to get rid of them or through initi citizen-initiated referendums do it themselves. No, I'm with you. I mean, I was very disappointed in that. I mean, we worked, as you said, when we were in the Wild Rose together uh, on things such as Citizens Initiative and, and Recall. And there was a lot of policy discussions and we knew same sort of thing. You have to set a bar. You don't want to recall held every time somebody's elected and, and you don't want a referendum every time somebody's fighting over a property line with a neighbor. But you have to make it achievable. And they yeah. purposely put it way out of reach. Yeah, 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 way out of reach in the number of signatures. And if I remember right, in the citizen initiative, he even put in a kind of a poison pill. If somebody starts a, a, a ballot, a citizen initiative uh, referendum question, and it doesn't achieve the bar, it isn't successful, nobody else can do it for five years. Uh, and I mean, so so can somebody start one just with the aim to sabotage? And, and the bar is so high anyway, it, uh, it, it's, it's next to impossible. Um, but, but let's, you know, I understand Switzerland, 8.4 million people, 50,000 people can sign a petition forcing a, a referendum to overturn any new federal government law. The main benefit I, I hear, Corey, is it, it forces the politicians to really, really consult before they put in any laws. Uh, who, you know, because, of course, they don't want laws overturned either. Uh, you know, why don't we put in these, these you know, important uh gatekeepers and these important things to stop at these these benchmarks and uh, instead you know we we you know again like it, it's it's uh when i think of how much change our system needs the fact that 2011 2012 you and me were running around saying all these things and here we are 2022 and and we've we're still talking about it uh ho hopefully the next two or three years will be more successful 
Yeah, well, on the bright side, we haven't given up yet. We're stubborn, yeah. if nothing else. Uh, so before I, I, I let you go, and I, like I said, I appreciate that, and I, I like being able to talk to you because uh, at least there's, there's disadvantages, of course, being stuck in an independent role, but there's advantages in, in being unrestrained, of course, and you can just speak to to what you want to feel. Or, you know, you're not worried about a party at this point. Uh, so just where can people find information on what you're up to and where you're communicating, and uh, you know, just your your constituency in general. Yeah, thank you, Corey. Yeah, please, Cypress Medicine Hat, uh, Drew Barnes uh, on Facebook and Twitter and, 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 and the website under Drew Barnes at Cypress Medicine Hat. And Corey, what we're really fighting for hard the next little while is Alberta first, economic freedom and individual opportunity. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, taxes are so high in Canada, taxes are so high, high in Alberta. Um, it's time to get get back to where people have the opportunity to work hard, take risk, and then share, share, share their results. Um, this, this, this is, this is a little bit of a, of a detour, but Johnny Goudreau signed with uh, Columbus yesterday. Uh, taxes, state tax in Columbus is 3.9% uh, in, in Ohio. There's a small, I think 2% tax in a Clum in Columbus. Alberta and Canadian taxes are as high as 48%. So was it a factor in his decision? You know, I don't know uh, how, how many businesses don't we get because there's nine American states with no no income tax. Uh, taxes are lower in many, many places around the world, never mind our gatekeepers and our regulation. So, Corey, please join me in a fight for economic freedom, individual op opportunity and Alberta families. Right on. Thanks, Drew. I'll well, keep fighting the good fight. And I hope your medicine hat uh, rodeo goes excellently. And uh, I hope we can talk again soon. We will. Corey, thank you. Have a good one.